Powers. Multiplying a number by itself lots of times. It's an easy way to make really big numbers, and really small numbers too. We can even use it as a shorthand to write large numbers down without bothering about all of the digits. But there's something strange going on here. We're told we can put any number we want on the bottom, but we're only allowed to put a whole number on the top, because we can only multiply something by itself a whole number of times. Now I don't know about you, but this seems a bit unfair to all of the other numbers. They're perfectly good numbers, but they're not allowed to go in the power. Maybe we can fix that. Hi, I'm Laura, and in this video we're going to look at extending the definition of powers to include more than just whole numbers. Let's get started by drawing a picture of what's going on. The easiest way to see what this all looks like is to draw a graph. Let's start with the graph of 2 to the x. For each value of x along the bottom, we can draw a dot to show where 2 to the x goes. Oops, that got a bit big. But if we plot a to the x for some smaller values of a, then we can see where the gaps are that we want to fill by extending our definition. Now it's up to us how we decide to define all these other powers, so we could do it any way we want. But most of them just don't look right. If we look at the graphs more closely, we can see that there's a way to smoothly join up all of the dots. But how do we translate that into numbers? We might be able to figure this out by looking at the graphs some more, but there might be a simpler way. Maybe if we spend more time looking at how powers work, then we'll see where to go from there. Powers are built from multiplication, so maybe we should ask what happens if you multiply numbers with powers together. But if all the numbers are different, then that doesn't seem to tell us much. And if the numbers in the power are the same, then it simplifies nicely, but that doesn't really tell us anything about the numbers at the top. Hmm. Maybe we should try making the numbers at the bottom the same. So 2 to the 3 times 2 to the 4 equals 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 times 2. That's a power of 2. How many 2's has it got? Well, there's 3 2's here, and there's 4 2's here. So that makes 2 to the power of 3 plus 4. We should probably check a few more examples to see if it always works. And maybe work through the algebra just to be sure. Looks good. So we've got our first rule for indices. OK, what next? Well, we've multiplied powers. What about powers of powers? How about 3 to the 3 to the 5? If we write it all out, we get 5 groups of 3 3s. So that's 15 3s overall, 3 to the power of 3 times 5. And if we look at the algebra, then we can see why this always works out. So that's our second rule. Now these two rules might not seem like very much, but in maths we can often get surprisingly complex outcomes from simple sets of rules. So let's see what we can do with what we've got so far. We'll start with something simple. What should 2 to the 0 be if it's going to follow our rules? Well, the special thing about 0 is that anything plus 0 is itself. So if we look at our first rule, we can see that multiplying by 2 to the 0 shouldn't change our answer either. There's only one number where multiplying by it doesn't change anything, and that's 1. So the only sensible choice for 2 to the 0 is 1. But we can go further with this. There wasn't anything special about choosing 2, so if we replace 2 with any other number, our logic still checks out. So we can see that if we want a sensible definition for a to the 0, it should always be 1. Now that we have a rule for 0, it looks like we could use this to get a rule for negatives. We know that if you add any number to its negative version, you get 0, so multiplying a positive power by a negative power should cancel out to give a power of 0. And we've just decided that this should be 1. So we can see that if we want our new definition to follow the rules we've already set out, that a negative power should give 1 divided by the same thing with a positive power. We can use a similar idea for fractional powers too. If we start with a to the half, we can see from our second rule that if we raise this to the power of 2, then we should get back to a to the 1, which is a. So unpacking this, we can see that we want a power of a half to mean a square root. And again, our logic works if we choose something other than 2, so we can see that there's only one sensible choice for a to the 1 over b, and it's the bth root of a. From there, it's easy to pin down all the other fractions by just noticing that b over c is just b times 1 over c. I should probably mention at this point that we haven't quite checked that all of our new definitions work. For example, we know that our definition for a power of 0 definitely follows our first rule, because that's how we defined it. 
but does it follow the second? And we know that two minuses make a plus, but if you minus a minus power, do you get back to where you started? There's quite a long list of stuff to check. Checking all these things can be quite technical and fiddly, but thankfully it all works out, and our new definitions behave in the way that we want them to. So we've now decided what it should mean to have any fraction in a power, positive or negative. We could have done this any way we wanted, but by making the choices that we have, we've preserved some of indices' nice behaviour. We've reached the point where we can fill in quite a lot more of our graphs, and as an added bonus, we've got some neat new ways to write complicated expressions involving roots. Of course, we still need to be careful not to square root a negative number, and we haven't decided what to do about powers that aren't fractions. There's a lot more going on here than first meets the eye, but that's a story for another day.